Thank you. You may be seated. Our text tonight, of course, is in the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 11, and we are looking at verses 4 through 18. The message entitled, Systematic Exposition and Witness, Part 2. We began this passage last week. There is so much in it, even though Peter is recounting exactly what happened in Acts chapter 10. Whenever God tells us something once, it not only is true, but we had better pay attention. But when he goes into detail twice in an extended passage, in two chapters that are right next to each other, you might guess that he is trying to emphasize something for us. And that is precisely what we have happening as we look at the actual narrative of Cornelius and his household in chapter 10. And now as we find Peter not just giving a quick summary, but going point by point, detail by detail, exactly parallel to what we saw back in chapter 10. God is making a very important emphasis on what transpired in that chapter. It is one of the major hinges of history. It is one of the major keys to what is happening now in the body of Christ. It is the point at which we as Gentiles, as a group, were brought into the body of Christ on a co-equal basis with the Jews. A fantastic and beautiful picture, not only of that event, but also of how we as believers are supposed to handle difficulties in the church. God gives it to us as an illustration so that we might understand basic principles for dealing with church fights, so that we might understand how to keep both the peace and the purity of the church, so that we might understand principles that relate to stronger brothers and weaker brothers who are thrown into the same cauldron under the same pressures that the church faced then, faces now, and will face in the future. Two chapters of the book of Acts are given to this issue. And as we saw, there are two key issues in the main theme as we're looking through this chapter. The issue of food fights and the issue of circumcision. Things that normally you and I do not think much about, normally don't pay any attention to, and yet when we looked at the statistics three or four weeks ago when we were dealing with those basic bottom line principles, we discovered that circumcision, for example, is mentioned more frequently in the New Testament than in the Old Testament, nearly three times as many times. Because God is using it as a visible illustration to teach spiritual truth. The same thing with food. We find there are dietary regulations in the Old Testament and quite complex regulations at that as to what you can eat and what you cannot eat. And suddenly we move into a situation where a principally Jewish church at Jerusalem is suddenly confronted with Peter, the lead apostle, going in and eating with Gentiles. No doubt things that were unclean according to Jewish dietary regulations. And that's the background for Peter's exposition. He doesn't try to get around it. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't try to soft pedal what he has done. Because God has opened Peter's eyes to a new work that God is doing when we move from Acts chapter 10 to Acts chapter 11 and throughout the rest of the book of Acts, God expanding and extending the gospel of Christ from Judea to Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The uttermost parts of the earth included Gentiles. And God in his grace has just opened the door 
for the Gentiles. Beginning in verse 4 of Acts chapter 11. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them. Too many of us start in the middle. People don't know what we're talking about. We continue on, skip around, and then by the time we're through, nobody knows the subject, nobody knows the issue, nobody knows the conclusions. Many of us do that kind of thing because we're so busy trying to defend ourselves with what we did. The reason we find peace and purity in the church by the time we get to the end of this passage is because Peter systematically rehearsed what God had done. Not merely what he had done, but what God had done. And at the end, they accept it. And he says, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descended as it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay, and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. He is reminding them that he was truly a kosher Jew at the time this occurred. But the voice answered me, For again from heaven, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. You remember a faithful soldier and two servants of Cornelius the centurion. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. And one of the principles you recall that we've been learning as we've done this study is the principle that we must do things by faith and not doubt, because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So the Holy Spirit reminds Peter of that at this point, nothing doubting. And then... Peter goes, but he says, Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. There were witnesses as to what had occurred. Witnesses who would be able to tell the group that had challenged Peter, that had put him on the spot in Jerusalem, whether or not what Peter was saying was true. We also pointed out that in practical terms, six men probably went just in case there was a trap laid for Peter, it would be two against one, and Peter could run away. We entered into the house, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Obviously, we are moving into the supernatural realm at this point. And Peter is responding, and Cornelius is responding to special revelation given to them, for a very specific purpose. Call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Is salvation a rather significant issue? Yes. And Peter is telling the Jews at Jerusalem, we have a bigger God than the God in the box that you think you have kept personal for yourself. I entered into the man's house and he told me, the reason the angel said I should call for you is because this man has words. And if you believe those words, you will be saved. Peter didn't come doing magic tricks. Peter didn't come with a large army and forced conversion as the Muslims have done across North Africa in the seventh century. He will tell you words whereby you shall be saved. And as he began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift, as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? 
When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now last week we covered a few things that we had not been able to cover the week before. The exposition of Romans chapter 14, which tied in with verses 1 through 3 here in chapter 11. And those were issues that clearly were underneath and underlying Peter's defense in the text that we've just read. We always have to test what we do by the Bible in addition to clearing our own conscience. That was the first issue that we covered. The second key issue in Romans 14 that we covered is the reason why we do what we do. We have to do all things as unto the Lord. The third key issue that we covered last week is the way Peter's action, his non-action, or his interaction affects the rest of the church, and that is a principle for us too. How does our action, non-action, or interaction affect the rest of the church? You see, the church at Jerusalem was very agitated over what Peter had done. Yet, the answer that he gave satisfied the church so that they were going to be at peace as well as have the purity of the church and make sure that the church was cleansed from false doctrine and from evil practice. The fourth key issue that we covered last week was how it affects your testimony for the Lord. Peter, as a leader, had the responsibility of bearing a testimony for Christ. All of us, not merely the leaders, have to consider every time we make a choice or a decision, how will this affect my testimony for Christ? And then make our decisions based on that. There will be some things that you in your own conscience will feel free to do. And yet you realize that if you do that, it will have an impact on your testimony for Jesus Christ. That was the issue of stumbling blocks. That was the issue of learning to restrict our own so-called Christian liberty. And the restriction of Christian liberty is in the area of the neutral issues. It's not a matter of restricting your Christian liberty when you decide not to go out and murder somebody. That's not your Christian liberty. You can't do that anyway. It's sin. It's not a matter of restricting your Christian liberty when it comes to loving your neighbor. (laughs) I think I'll not love them, and I will restrict my Christian liberty by not loving my neighbor. No, that's an obligation. Christian liberty deals with issues that are, technical term, adiaphorous. It deals with the issues that are the neutral issues in and of themselves, but issues that take on a moral or an immoral taint within the context in which they find themselves. And it is here that you and I need to understand what it means to restrict our Christian liberty. Things that we may be able to allow in our own conscience and can do by faith. Issues in which the action or the thought or the word or the attitude is neutral, but within a context, it takes on a character. That's the issue of Christian liberty and stumbling blocks. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, we're talking in the context of food, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. That's on the neutral issue of food. It's not talking about sexual sin. It's not talking about theft. It's not talking about other things. That It's okay for some people, but not okay for other people. It's on a neutral issue. But if your brother be grieved with your meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. As we noted, people tend to focus on the trivia 
instead of the internal issues of substance. For he that in these things, this is Romans 14, 18 now, serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. You see, God doesn't look merely for conformity to the letter of the law, but he is looking for conformity to the spirit of the law, which is not less than the law, but the spirit of the law always goes beyond what the law requires. People say, oh, I don't have to follow the letter of the law. I just have to follow the spirit of the law. They don't understand what it means to follow the spirit of the law. Because love always does more than the law requires. Let me say that again. Love always does more than what the law requires. If you love your brother, you will do more for him than the law ever required you to do. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you will do more for your neighbor than the law ever required you to do. But you see, having the spirit of the law also means you have the empowerment to do it, the Holy Spirit, and not merely the flesh, which will always fail you. The solution to most every neutral problem or division in the body of Christ is found when we understand what true Christian liberty is. It is the liberty of sacrifice. It is the liberty of doing more than we're required to do, not less than we're required to do, or only the minimum of what we're required to do, but doing for others what Christ did for us. He loved us and gave himself for us. If you were driving through Florida, and most of you have at one point or another, you have driven through the Everglades. And as you know, there are signs along the way. In fact, I have a picture of my son Philemon holding one of his tiny children in his arms, standing underneath a sign that is a picture of a puma or a mountain lion, showing that that's an area where those mountain lions, or whichever big cat it is, cross the road. In other places, you will see a sign with a picture of an alligator on it, especially as you drive some of the back roads down in the area of the Everglades, meaning watch out for alligators. <laughs> now, I think I may have shared this illustration some time ago, but it's certainly appropriate here. In Reader's Digest a number of years ago, there was an article about a young man and his wife and their tiny child driving through that area. And they got out to have a picnic lunch next to what looked like a very pretty little lake. And they set up the picnic lunch. And the little girl and her little dog were playing by the lake. And this little child took a stick and threw it out into the water. And the little dog jumped into the water and swam out and grabbed the stick. And the dad glanced up and saw the little dog get the stick. And then he saw something else that brought terror to his heart. He saw an alligator moving swiftly toward the little dog in the water and the little child standing next to the water. And the father, in a panic, ran into the water and tried to grab the little dog, but the alligator got the little dog just before the father got to it and started heading back into deep water, and the father jumped on the back of the alligator and began pounding its head and trying to pull its jaws apart because he knew that that little dog was very precious to his child. And the alligator continued to move into deeper water, and then the father began to realize, if there's one alligator, there are probably more than one. And so he jumped off the alligator's back, ran back to the shore, grabbed his child, and they ran back to their car. True story. Now, suppose that there was a law that said whenever you see an alligator grab a pet dog, you are required by law to jump into the water and try to take the dog away from the alligator. 
Suppose that was the law. Do you think that the law would be strong enough to motivate you to try to rescue a pet dog from an alligator in that situation? I think not. It was not because the law required this man to jump in and do something. It was because he loved that little dog. You see, love is always a stronger motivating force than love, than law ever could be. If we knew that was the law and we were driving through the Everglades and we saw an alligator rush to the shore and grab a little dog and head back in, we would look the other way and keep on driving. Love is a much more powerful motivating force than law. Grace is a much more powerful motivating force than law. People who talk about, well, I'll keep the spirit of the law, but I don't have to keep the letter of the law, do not understand the spirit of the law, which is love. And love always does more than the law ever required. Because it's an internal motivation, not an external motivation. The summary principle is given to us in Romans chapter 14, verses 20 through 22. For meat destroy not the work of God. We're talking back about the food issue here. The two things that the church at Jerusalem was worried about with Peter, circumcision and food, for meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. We pointed out last week that if nothing else among all the reasons to avoid alcoholic beverages convinces you that it's wrong... That clearly puts an absolute prohibition on insisting on your so-called right to drink alcohol. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. That's a powerful principle there that applies to every area of the Christian life. Everything we do must be an act of faith. There are no exceptions. You see, that's what the walk of faith is all about. We are not to be coasting in neutral, because when you coast in neutral, very soon your car begins to roll downhill backwards. We are to do everything as an act of faith. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. There must be positive, motivating power behind everything that we do. That is what the walk of faith, it doesn't say just sort of saunter by faith, sit down by faith, backpedal by faith. We are to walk by faith. Now, here we get to verse 23. And he that doubteth, opposite of faith, he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. He doesn't say whatsoever of not of, is, of faith is neutral. He says, if you're not doing it by faith, you are in fact committing sin. That's a challenge, isn't it? That can't be done in the flesh. The only way that you and I can walk by faith is when we are walking in the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has control of our life, when he's in the steering wheel seat, when he's the one who is empowering us to move forward. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You say, well, I'm not too bad of a sinner. I sort of make it through every day. Listen, if you're not walking by faith, everything you're doing when you are not walking by faith is sin. What does your record look like for this past week? How much of that was a walk of faith? How much of that was the only other option? 
which is sin. You see, these are basic principles that are being laid down in practice by the Apostle Peter as he recounts what happened in Acts chapter 10. Make sure that whatever position you take regarding food and regarding circumcision and the other things that are here in this passage are an act of faith, not of doubt. That systematic exposition in Acts chapter 11, we just read it, also covers additional principles that are further explained in the doctrinal epistles of the New Testament. The second major passage that gives controlling principles on these issues is 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, I've read a small portion of that several weeks ago, but I want to pick up just a few selected verses now that we've learned the basic principles. Here we are in 1 Corinthians 8.1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So here we have the food issue again. Paul's going to be dealing with food that has been stuck in front of an idol. And I saw quite a bit of this when I was in China with the Buddhists there. We actually went through a gigantic Buddhist temple where there were seven different Buddhas in that temple all different kinds of Buddhas. In fact, one, a female Buddha, bet you didn't know there were female Buddhas. There was one brought from India where they had a female Buddha and was brought to this place centuries ago. And in there we saw people dressed in modern business clothes, lighting little incense sticks, bringing fruit, placing it on a platter in front of that Buddha, placing their incense sticks in various little holders, thousands of people walking around, huge complex, and our guide explaining it to us. His mother was a Buddhist. He was an atheist. Very pleasant, but because he'd been raised in the communist schools of Red China, had come to the conclusion that there is no God. Now picture that for a moment. Here is some stuff, some kind of food that's been on a plate in front of a big, fat, ugly, grinning Buddha. And then because there's way too much for the number of priests that are in that temple, they're going to take it and sell it. And the people have brought their very best offerings different kinds of meat, different kinds of vegetables and fruit, different kinds of stuff. And so it got sold in a place called, the scripture translated as the shambles, in the market. Now, you know it's been offered to idols. Can you eat it? That's what Paul is dealing with here in 1 Corinthians 8. Concerning things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You know, we tend to get fat heads. We tend to get proud when we have head knowledge. See a lot of young men coming through seminary that way. They have learned all the theology. They know the stuff you got to know to be theologically on target. Dear people, if it never gets out of your head and into your hands, it is utterly worthless. I had a man come up to me this morning after the service and say, I sure appreciated that message, because where we used to go to church, they had all the theology, but they never told us how it works. They never told us what we're supposed to do with it. You have to have sound doctrine, otherwise you have false practice. But you can have sound doctrine and never live for Christ. True theology, truly believed, will always change your life. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifieth. That is, 
Charity, that's agape love there, builds up the church. And how does it do it? We're going to discover in this passage. It does it by being willing to yield our rights. We're not talking about the things that in and of themselves are morally reprehensible. We're not talking about doctrine that is deviant. We're talking about those neutral things whereby you have a right to do it, but you choose not to do it so that you do not harm a weaker brother, not because the law forbids you, but because you have the more powerful motivating factor. You have a love for other Christians. That's powerful, people. That's the way in which the body of Christ is built up not puffed up. Jumping down to verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, so here we have it again, the issue of kosher food versus non-kosher foods, we know, there's your knowledge business, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Now, demons do like to hang around idols, and behind every idol there is a demon wishing, desiring worship. But the idol itself is nothing. Paul makes that clear here in verse 4. There's only one God. All the other things that people call gods are not gods. Verse 7. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. Remember where he started? The contrast between knowledge and love. You have knowledge. Somebody else does not have that knowledge. And it affects their conscience. Look at the next phrase. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now stop and think about that for a second. The idol is nothing. The food that got stuck on the plate in front of the idol didn't get idol cooties on it. It didn't get contaminated by some supernatural spiritual force that entered into that food so that when you eat it, it contaminates you. The idol is nothing. But if you eat it as though because it's been offered to an idol, it is somehow sacrilegious. You being a Christian, and this thing offered to an idol, how can you eat that thing? It was offered to an idol. You have a conscience of the idol. The man who eats that way actually defiles his conscience. Verse 8. But meat commendeth us not to God... It's not like, well, God, today I ate only lamb and I didn't eat any pork. No bacon for breakfast. I had lamb chops instead. Meat does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. You might be hungrier, but the what you eat is not the issue. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours. That is, you have knowledge that you can eat anything that God has created. Doesn't matter what the animal is, doesn't matter what the bird is, doesn't matter what the fish is. All those dietary regulations of the Old Testament that said that you can't eat bats and you can't eat mice and you can't eat centipedes, <laughs> most of us wouldn't want to simply because of the way we were raised. We weren't raised in a culture where those things are delicacies, and they are to some people. We could eat them if we wanted to. We don't have to, but we could if we wanted to. But there are those who do not have freedom of conscience because they do not have that knowledge. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Exactly the same thing he was talking about in Romans 14, 21. It's good neither to eat flesh or drink wine or anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Stumbling block, Romans chapter 14, verse 21. Stumbling block, 1 Corinthians 
chapter 8, verse 7 and 9. You see, what we're dealing with in that passage in Acts chapter 11 was a major issue in the church. And so Paul not only deals with the issue, but he lays down general principles so that we might know how to apply the principles against making a stumbling block for brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 10, 1 Corinthians 8. For if any man see thee... Now what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with your external testimony before other people. When you do things, people see you. If any man see thee, which hast knowledge, here we are back to that issue of knowledge versus love again. Here we have this issue of knowledge, your proud rights, because you understand theology. If any man see thee, sit at meat in the idol's temple, you've decided to go over there and have dinner. Hey, it's a good restaurant. They cook it for you. It's not only been offered to an idol, but here they've got their own little temple cafe. You know, it's sort of interesting. There are churches today where they have little coffee shops sort of set up in these big, huge lobbies of these mega churches, and people sit out there and eat donuts and coffee and stuff before the services and cart it in with them into the services of the wear their bikinis into church services and get up and wander around and do their own thing while the rock band is on stage wiggling back and forth and lights are flashing and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, the temples did that too, the pagan temples. They had their own little coffee shops right out there in the main lobby of the temple. If anybody sees you go in and eat there, and he's a weak brother, what happens? He sees you sit at meat in the idol's temple. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols. Now you can do it. You have knowledge that there's nothing wrong with the meat. You have knowledge that it's okay to go in there and have lunch. You know, nothing's going to happen to you as a result. God isn't going to judge you because you ate food there. But you do risk judgment on a different issue. Because there may be a brother who, having broken away from that pagan religion, having been involved in the immorality of that pagan religion, having been involved in the worship of the idol that was in that temple, he says, wow, if Joe can do it, I guess I can do it too. But deep down inside, he has this twinge of conscience that makes him wonder, Joe is a stronger Christian than I am, so I guess it's I, I guess I guess it's okay for me to do it too. Listen to what Paul says about that. Shall not his conscience be emboldened? He becomes brave and does something that his conscience really doesn't want him to do, to eat those things which are offered to idols, and in that manner he defiles his conscience. And through thy knowledge, here we go again. What are you going to show off to other Christians, to new converts, to those who are not yet mature in their faith? So often what we want to show off is our knowledge. Remember, knowledge puffs up, but charity edifieth. Through thy knowledge, the thing that puffs you up, that doesn't show love to your weaker brother, through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Verse 12, But when ye sin, so against the brethren. Now in other passages, he's dealing with your testimony in front of unsaved pagans. But here he's dealing with your testimony in front of Christians who have not yet grown to the point of spiritual maturity that you have. Peter was in that situation in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11. Here are other Christians. It's believers in the church who bring up the charges against Peter 
having gone in and eaten with uncircumcised Gentiles. Peter handled it gently by covering all the ground. And here we find Paul expounding what it is that Peter actually did and what we as believers, if we are mature in Christ, will do for the sake of our weaker brothers. If you cause them to stumble, you sin against the, with the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. That's verse 12. Read it for yourself. When you wound the weaker brethren, when you sin against the weaker brethren, when you wound their weak, weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. Verse 13, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Jump to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Look at this next phrase. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. The truth is to be made manifest, that it is to become visible in our lives in a way that commends us to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, several years ago, I gave you this illustration, but it certainly fits here. Many, many years ago, when I was in high school, uh, I got my second class radio license and worked as an announcer at a radio station in San Antonio. It was called KDRY. That stood for Keep Dry. It was owned by Dr. Sam Morris, a man who was known as the voice of temperance in the great Southwest. He hated the liquor industry. Keep Dry. Dr. Sam constantly preached on that radio station against the three breweries that were in town. And they hated him for it because he was constantly hammering against how bad the alcohol industry was. He went on a trip overseas and on the way back one of their planes was delayed and so the, the group that was together was invited into the VIP lounge uh, for that particular airline. They all went in and signed the guest book and sat down at the table to eat and Dr. Sam focused his eyes in the semi-dark and saw that at the back of that restaurant there was a bar. He was furious. He jumped up from the table, ran up to where the guest book was located and ripped the page out of the guest book on which he had signed his name and declared no one will ever say that Sam Morris was in a bar. His father had been an alcoholic who beat him and his brothers and sisters and his mother every time he came home drunk. So he hated liquor. Now, when I tell that story, I ask people, was Dr. Sam Morris the weaker brother? Because of his attitude toward alcohol, was he the weaker brother? And you know the surprising answer is no. He was not the weaker brother. He was a dominant brother, a great man of God. I loved him and honored him very greatly. But he was not the weaker brother. See, that's not the guy that's being described here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 or Romans chapter 14. The weaker brother is the one who sees you, the stronger brother, doing something and then is tempted to do it himself. Dr. Sam would never have been tempted to touch a drop of alcohol. He's not the weaker brother. The weaker brother is the one who looks up to you. The weaker brother is the one for whom you are setting an example. The weaker brother is the one who is tempted and emboldened to violate his conscience by what you do. Dear people, we don't understand who our weaker brothers are. Years ago when I was in college, 
I used to go with a, a team to a rescue mission in one of the seediest, worst sections of Boston, bringing in drunks off the street and sharing the gospel with them. Now suppose a man came to share the gospel of Christ with these men who had been alcoholics, and one comes to Christ. And so that brother who has led him to Christ invites him over for dinner. And he's growing in his faith, and he's excited about Jesus. And the brother and his wife have laid out a beautiful table with all kinds of lovely things on it. And to celebrate the occasion, this brother reaches into the refrigerator and brings out a very expensive bottle of wine and begins to pour the glasses. Here's a man who has just been rescued from a life of drunkenness. He's saved, but he's still a weak, fragile brother. And he thinks to himself, what shall I do? This is the man who led me to Christ. This is a man who has taught me God's word. And yet this is a man who's pouring wine into my glass. I guess it's okay to take a drink. Because he's been a Christian a whole lot longer than I do. He knows the Bible a whole lot better than I do. I guess it's okay. You sin against the weaker brother. You embolden him to defile his conscience. And in sinning against the weaker brother, you sin against Christ. And suppose he goes back to being a drunkard. See, Paul's dealing with some very important issues. Issues where the groundwork was laid in Acts 10 and Acts 11 concerning how we are to deal with weaker brothers in Christ. What we can eat, what we can't eat. The issue of circumcision or non-circumcision. Gentiles versus Jews. What are we required to do in relation to the law and what are we required to do in relation to love? And grace and making not only for the purity, but for the peace of the body of Christ. You know, uh, the weaker brother is the one who will be tempted by you, the stronger brother, to violate his conscience, perhaps because of his past, perhaps because of his newness to the Christian faith, perhaps because he associates certain activities, whether rightly or wrongly, with evil people. For example, when I was growing up, going to a movie theater was an issue. Most Christians don't care today, but when I was growing up, it was a really big deal. If you were a Christian, you did not walk through the doors of a movie theater. It was a big deal if you went into a building where secular movies were shown, and now Christians get the secular movies and check them out at the red box right across the street here, and uh, take them home and watch them and eat popcorn and, you know, sort of ignore the bad language and all the things going on. Remember we talked about the neutral categories? That word was adiaphorous, that which is neither moral nor immoral in itself. Now many of those films are immoral in themselves. But the neutral ones may take on a moral or immoral tone in a particular context. You know, walking into a building that has a lot of seats and a big screen is neutral. But it will have a context. And there will be people who watch you as a Christian and who are affected by things that you do, both other believers and pagans who are watching you who don't really have a very good understanding of what Christianity is all about. And the question is, will you expand or will you contract your testimony for Christ? Are you willing are you willing 
to restrict your own liberty so that you don't cause a weaker brother to stumble and so that you do not hinder the testimony of Christ to those who are lost. They may be wrong. They may be dead wrong. But don't let some stupid thing fall in the way of you and sharing Christ. You know, the issues of what is right and wrong, that's where young people going off to college are often challenged. The secular universities have learned how to pummel Christians and how to pummel their sense of right and wrong by using neutral things, but putting them in a context where there are no right answers. You know... Um, let me give you an illustration here. It's not wrong to kill a sheep and to eat it. It's not wrong. Not long ago, uh, we in fact had some lamb chops. They were on sale. It was delicious. Uh, and in the Bible, it's clear that there were godly people who ate sheep. However, it is wrong to kill a sheep and eat it if the sheep belongs to your neighbor. The illustration of Nathan the prophet, which he gave to David where he told him about a man who took a lamb that belonged to the neighbor and that was a pet, and the man killed that lamb and served it as a feast to a visitor, it made David very, very mad. You see, the killing of the lamb in that context was wrong. Killing it and eating it is not a wrong thing, but killing it in that context and eating it is wrong. It's neutral in and of itself, but in its context... It takes on moral tones. Certain things are always wrong. Certain things are always immoral, like committing adultery. Certain things are always righteous, such as worshiping the true God and in spirit and in truth. But the kid going off to college is going to be put in a class where he is going to learn, if it's a secular university, he's going to be pushed with situation ethics, attacks, on the moral standards of Bible-believing Christians, it always happens in secular schools, sometimes in so-called Christian schools, where a moral dilemma is posed, where the Christian is given only wrong choices as alternatives. The world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons try to come up with situations that are neutral in and of themselves, but packaged in a context where only wrong choices are available. Dear people, if you're faced with one of those, remember this. In the real world, God always makes a righteous choice possible so that Christians can walk by faith, so that Christians can please God. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. The devil doesn't want you to believe that there is a way of escape. The devil wants you to believe that the choices are limited. The devil wants you to believe that there is no choice that is right or wrong. You have to choose the lesser of two evils. You do not have to choose the lesser of two evils on any occasion. Because God has promised there is a way of escape. You may not see it immediately. You may have to spend some time in prayer. You may have to spend some time in studying the word of God, but God has made a promise and God keeps his promises. You know the lifeboat scenario. It's a hypothetical that's made up to challenge college freshman students. Here you are, you're riding in a, a lifeboat with a bunch of other people. Now riding in a lifeboat is a neutral issue, isn't it? And there's only a small amount of food or water, so of course eating small amounts of food and water, that's a neutral issue. You're packed tightly in the lifeboat with others. That's a neutral issue. There's nothing wrong with being packed tightly in a lifeboat with other people. But the scene is phrased in this way. Since there's only limited food and water, someone must be thrown out of the boat for the rest of the passengers to survive. And so the issue becomes, and they tell you a little bit about each one of the passengers. If you were in that lifeboat, which of these people would be the most valuable to keep alive and which of these people would be the least valuable of the people to keep 
alive. They don't give you any options in the choices that are there for swimming away from the boat yourself, for making a self-sacrifice. They don't give you any choices for prayer. They don't give you any choices about witnessing to others who are in this crisis situation so that they might know Christ and enter into eternity in the face of certain death. They don't give you those choices. But people, it might be the very reason you're in the lifeboat with those people. Not to figure out who you can kill, but who you can save. Don't fall prey to the false dichotomy where all the choices are wrong. You know, not long ago we saw, show, uh, showed a series in prayer meeting called Against All Odds, Israel Survives. It was a, uh, an incredible series on the different miraculous things that God has done to preserve national Israel after its formation in a day back in 1948. And in one of those videos in the series, the man who was making the series interviewed the curator at the Holocaust Museum. And she told about a time when in the Warsaw Ghetto, they were running out of insulin for the diabetic patients. And so a committee was formed made up of various rabbis and various doctors and various Jewish scholars in the Warsaw Ghetto during the Holocaust where they had to discuss this lack of insulin and yet the number of patients that they had who needed it. And as they argued back and forth as to who should we give it to and who should we not give it to, they finally came to the conclusion, you know what we're doing is exactly what the Nazis have done with us. They've decided that certain people are more valuable than other people, and we will not be put into that category of deciding who is valuable and who is not valuable. And so they simply continued to use the insulin until it ran out, and they all died. But they would not say, this man is more valuable than that woman, or this woman is more valuable than that child. You see, that's precisely what the Nazis had done. They'd said, the Aryan race is more valuable than the Jewish race. And so we exterminate the Jews. Those are the serious examples. Let me give you one that's a little more humorous. Reminds me of the story of a plane with five passengers that was going down, but there were only four parachutes. The first man jumped to his feet. He said, I'm too important to die. I'm the president of France. So he grabbed a parachute and jumped out crying, Vive la France. The second jumped to his feet. He said, I'm too important to die. I'm the prime minister of England. With that, he grabbed a parachute and jumped out crying, Long live the queen. The next passenger grabbed a chute and shouted, I'm too important to die. I'm the greatest genius in the world. And with that, he jumped out. That left only a very weak, sick old man and a Boy Scout. The old man looked sadly at the Boy Scout and said, I've lived a long life and I know I'm going to die soon anyway. You take the last parachute and save yourself. I choose to make that sacrifice so that you may live. Don't worry, mister, said the Boy Scout. We still have enough parachutes. The greatest genius in the world just grabbed my backpack and jumped out. <laughs> I think you get my point. Dear people, we must learn, if we are mature Christians, to sacrifice our own rights for the sake of our testimony to the unsaved, for the sake of not causing a weaker brother to stumble. In some cases, things are permitted. In other cases, they are not. Food is not intrinsically evil. Verse 25 of chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no questions for conscience' sake. If any of them that believe not, now here we're dealing not with weaker brothers, we're dealing with unbelievers in chapter 10. 
If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no questions for conscience' sake. In other words, you're not obliged to check it out first. Like, George, I know you're a Diana worshiper. Did this food just perchance happen to be offered at the temple of Diana? You don't have to ask that question. You ask no questions. You've been invited to, by an unbeliever to eat lunch with him. Peter had been invited by an unbeliever to eat lunch with him. That's what happened in Acts chapter 10. He's invited into this man's house. He has food with uncircumcised Gentiles. Ask not for conscience sake. But if any man says unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience I say not thine own, but of the other. You see, the pagan is testing you. He has odd ideas about what Christians are like. He has odd ideas about what Christians are allowed to do and what Christians are not allowed to do. He wants to see if you're going to compromise. That's why he asked you or told you that this has been offered in sacrifice to an idol. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? The issue of Christian liberty is here. That doesn't, that's not fair. I would sure like to have a piece of that guy's steak, but he just told me it was offered to an idol. Why is my Christian liberty being judged by his conscience? Well, our time is up. In fact, it's way past time. Paul doesn't answer the question, but he does give a reason, and we'll talk about that next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here tonight, the privilege of studying your word, for the privilege of learning how we as Christians are supposed to interact in the body of Christ. How we are not to cause a stumbling block to weaker brothers. How we are not to put a barricade between us and non-believers to whom we are trying to witness. How even when we have knowledge, our knowledge is not enough. It's the issue of whether we love the brethren and are willing to sacrifice for the brethren as Christ sacrificed himself for us. We pray, Father, that you'll take your word and use it by your Holy Spirit in each of our hearts to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to...